Hi gang, Dave the Maverick Beekeeper. For those who are returning to my channel, welcome back. And for those that are new to the channel, you're also welcome. We're now going on to the next of the Disease of the Day series, which is Bold Brood. I'm also going to talk about Wax Moth, which really goes hand in hand with this brood disorder. Um, there is some reading to do, there is some pronunciation of Latin names, so God help me. So enjoy the next part, which is Bold Brood. There are currently two moths that present problems to beekeepers in the UK. They are the lesser wax moth, Acroa chrysella, and the greater wax moth, Galleria melanella. Both wax moth species undergo complete metamorphosis and have four stages of development, egg, larva, pupa, and adult. Generally speaking, wax moth are considered a minor pest of the honeybee. However, they can cause problems for weak hives. What are the problems wax moth cause? Wax moth and the larvae do not kill honeybees or their colonies, but are often found destroying unoccupied drawn comb in colonies that have failing queens, been damaged by pesticides, are weak, queenless, starving or diseased. They also have the potential to destroy or damage stored comb. The greater wax moth can also cause damage to hive components by boring into the woodwork of the hives and frames making boat shaped indentations and is generally recognized as causing significantly more damage than the lesser wax moth. So do they have any benefits to bees and beekeepers? In foul brood diseased areas it is probably the beekeeper's best friend as it removes infectious comb from the disease cycle. This is particularly important respecting feral or abandoned colonies. Certainly when the greater Mac Wax moth arrived in New Zealand as an exotic species. It was accompanied by a decline in the number of cases of American fowl brood. What is the life cycle? In order to control wax moth infestation, it's important to be able to recognize them and understand their life cycle so appropriate action may be taken. So firstly, greater wax moth. The adult moth has a length of about 20 millimeters and a wingspan between 24 and 33 millimeters and is brown color with a white ash markings. When seen in a hive it makes short runs or flights to darkness. It can sometimes be seen perching and flying in a vicinity of bee colonies at dusk usually entering hives or boxes at that time. Females lay clumps of eggs in crevices within the hive laying between 300 and 600 eggs which are pink, cream white and are difficult to see. They hatch after five to eight days into larvae that cause the damage to bee combs. These larvae cannot ingest beeswax, but eat it and live on the impurities contained therein. As a result, they are generally found in brood comb or any comb containing organic matter. The larvae burrow through combs, often just under the cappings, leaving a silken white tunnel behind them. The bee pupae and the cells are rarely damaged, but sometimes become trapped in the cells by the silk threads and die. The larvae grow from 24 to 33 millimeters in length, and when they pupate, often burrow into wooden frame components next to frame lugs or adjacent to the hive walls, leaving boat-shaped furrows about 15 millimeters long. In serious infestations, the entire box can be filled with pupae in white silk cocoons. These are usually accompanied with dark specks of frass, frass being wood debris, on emergent adults, mature and usually mate within the hive. The lesser wax moth. The adult moth has a length of approximately 10 to 13 millimeters and a wingspan of 11 to 14 millimeters and is a silvery gray to buff in color with a yellow head. When seen, it either flies, runs very quickly, or holds onto the comb, vibrating its wings. Each female can lay between 250 and 300 eggs, hatching into larvae that are similar in appearance to the greater wax moth larva, but are smaller in size. Though larvae consume honey, pollen, and wax, they are not found in comb occupied by bees and do not damage hive components. Lesser wax moth larvae are unable to compete with the greater wax moth larvae as the latter will eat them. Keeping strong and healthy colonies is the best prevention against wax moth infestations. 
and they are not controlled, infestation can rapidly multiply being exacerbated in warmer conditions. Although the wax moth is considered a minor pest, it still can damage a lot of the hive components and the hive itself. Here is a pictorial representation of the damage that they can cause. Although we have talked about the wax moth, there can be cases of mistaken identity. The larva of the small hive beetle, Athena tumida, shows a striking resemblance to wax moth larva and will consume beeswax, honey, pollen and brood, resulting in total devastation of bee colonies. The two key features used to distinguish small hive beetle larvae from the greater wax moth larvae are three pairs of legs near the head and spines protruding from the dorsum. Let's now talk about how ball brood manifests within the colony. The most usual cause of ball brood is wax moth larvae, both lesser and greater, tunneling below the surface of the comb. The moth larvae tunnel under the brood cappings. The bees will tear down cell cappings to clean out cells, leaving perforated and exposed cells with brooding, and sometimes these partial cappings have a raised lip protruding from the comb surface. The condition also occurs over multiple cells in a linear pattern. The symptoms are quite easy to spot. The developing pupae are usually sealed in their cells under wax cappings eight to nine days after laying. Boiled brood may be seen as small patches of normal developing larvae with uncapped or partially capped cells. The uncapped larvae will usually emerge as fully developed adults, although a few malformed adults may result from contaminants becoming deposited on developing larvae. Wax moth damage is also apparent as a white linear line among the biscuit colored cappings. Treatment is fairly straightforward. Strong colonies of bees will reduce the effects of wax moth and in the case of a genetic form of bold brood, requeening of the colony will usually resolve the problem. Well, that concludes uh, the subject of bold brood and wax moth. Hopefully you find that informative and interesting. Uh, any research uh, that I've done, I'll put in the link uh, in the description below. I'll also link you up to the other two episodes for those of you that are new to the channel, um, so you can follow the series. Uh, the next one we're going to go on to is EFB and AFB, uh, European Fowl Brood, American Fowl Brood. Again, as I said before, big subject, so that one's going to take a while for me to get together. Uh, in the meantime, I'd just like to thank anybody who's watching this series and anybody who has subscribed and liked and also commented. So I look forward to the next episode and I hope you enjoy it and we'll see you all very soon on the flip side of the brief.